God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. Amen. Praise God for that. I want to invite you to join me in Isaiah chapter 11 this morning as we turn our attention to the theme of peace. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, and if you would, please stand in honor of God's word. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor. And decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist. And faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb. And the leopard shall lie down with the young goat. And the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze Their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples of him, shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. Let's pray. Father, as we look at peace this morning, I pray that we would not scoff at the very idea that there could be such a thing in this world. There's a lot of brokenness in the world that we live in today. And yet, Father, I pray that we would be Believers, that we'd be those who trust in your promise, in your word, that you bring transformation, that you bring life, that you bring hope and peace and joy and love. So I pray this morning we would abide in the person of Christ, in his perfect love for us, that he would die for us on the cross for our sins, standing in our place condemned taking our punishment on himself, absorbing the wrath that we deserve. Lord, help us to be thankful this morning, and I pray that that truth would take root in our hearts and result in peace in the present. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Last week, we looked at hope and Uh, We're kind of going through the different themes of Advent, last week being, of course, hope. And we said that we can have hope based upon the promises of God uh, that we found in Isaiah chapter 9, just a couple of chapters earlier. You remember that famous passage that was read just a little bit earlier, "...for to us a child is born, a son is given." This was spoken to a people who lived in darkness who lived in exile, who lived in uh, under oppression, and God was wanting to give them a word of hope. And uh, the way he did that was to provide a promise to them. And they received hope by believing on that promise. And I like to uh, uh, say again what uh, I mentioned last week about 1 Thessalonians 4.13. I love the way that Paul... uh, tries to comfort those in a time of grief. Uh, I don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, and grieve as those do who have no hope. In other words, he wanted them to be informed, and those promises that he was going to give them of Jesus Christ and his return and raising the dead up to be with him forever, those promises and truths were to transform their present reality. And that's what we looked at last week in Isaiah chapter 9. These promises transformed the way that they understood the world in which they lived. 
that because the Messiah would come, because this child would come, this son would come, there would be light. There is peace. There is a joy that passes understanding. Why? Because of the person of Jesus Christ, the, the prophesied one, the one who is to come. And now today, we turn our, our gaze to this idea of peace. And I want to say that you can experience peace this morning, the peace of Jesus, by cherishing four biblical truths. Truth number one, our brokenness is not beyond restoration. Our brokenness is not beyond restoration. Notice that first verse. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his root shall bear fruit. Now, one of the things I love about the Bible, it is not like a textbook that you would just read in a class that just is divulging this uh, mountain of information for you to think through all the facts, all the statistics. We live in a day and age where we like bullet points, we like statistics. That's why I just gave you statistics earlier about the IMB. We love that kind of stuff. That's the way that we think, and we love polls, and we love surveys and questionnaires, and we've got this very scientific way in which we understand things. Speak very clearly. We don't uh, a lot of times like to use metaphors and stuff like that, but in Isaiah chapter 11, and another biblical text, they love to give us these word pictures to help us understand a deeper reality. I'm a little bit more lined up with them. I love stories. I love pictures. I love this uh, metaphor that he uses here of a stump, a shoot from the stump of Jesse. Now, what on earth is he talking about? What do you mean? There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. Well, you got to look back up just a little bit earlier, and let's just look a couple of verses before that. He's talking of the remnant of Israel and how they will return. Okay, now you remember when we went through Haggai, uh, you got this remnant, okay? Uh, you got this remnant of people left, and way back when they built Solomon's temple, you had, you know, you, you had all the, the wealth and the riches and the people to build this massive temple. And now uh, when Haggai rolled around, looking around like, man, we're the bad news bears. We ain't got a shot, guys. How are we going to do what they did? We don't have a chance in the world. And so you have this idea again of this remnant. They're looking at all these giants of, a nation, of nations around them. And they're saying, how, how can we come out of this? How can we get our way out of this? Notice verse 33, uh, Isaiah 10, 33. Behold, the Lord God of hosts will lop the bows with terrifying power and great in height will be hewn down and the lofty will be brought low and he will cut down the thickets of the forest with an ax and Lebanon will fall by the majestic one. God is saying, okay, here's the result of sin. The result of their sin was that they were exiled. The result of the sins of the nations around them, God's going to chop them down because of their sin. There's going to be punishment. There's going to be destruction. And this is what sin does. You look all the way back at the beginning of the Bible. How many chapters in the Bible do we make it before things ain't so good anymore? I mean, we, we make it two chapters and everything's okay. And then chapter three, everything falls apart. I mean, that's how long we lasted in the grand story of the Bible. Three chapters in, and it's what you call the fall. And it starts this cycle throughout the Bible of God giving incredible blessing, giving incredible opportunity, and we, all like the prodigal son, we squander our father's blessing and wealth. This is what Adam did. This is what Cain did. This is what the people did in the day. This is what Lamech did. We give Cain a bad name, but Lamech comes along. He says, you think Cain was bad. I'm like a whole bunch worse than he is. And he was proud of it. He was arrogant about it. And then it, it's not just one person. It's not just that guy. You know, everybody knows the guy. He's the bad guy. He's the bad guy. It's not just a guy anymore. By the time you get to Noah, it's everybody. Every thought and intention of man's heart is evil, the Bible says. It is an epidemic. The, the sin of Adam went viral, contagious, catastrophic for the whole world. 
And now you see the nation of Israel, the nations around them, God says, he will cut down the thickets of the forest with an axe, and Lebanon will fall by the majestic one. So this is like a picture of battle, okay? And a picture of battle where the forest is decimated, it's burned, and all you see are just a bunch of stumps. It's devastation. And when you look at a scene like that, there's not a whole lot of hope. Not a whole lot of hope. It's kind of like in uh, the Valley of Dry Bones. You're looking around, and what do you see? Do you see life anywhere? Is there any life? There's just dry bones. They're dry. Why, why do you say that they're dry? Because they're, they don't have a shot. They've been dead for a while. Why? Because of our rebellion against God. And that's the picture here. It's like a Valley of Dry Bones, except this time it's just like a, a burnt forest. Everything's been chopped down. Everything's been devastated. It doesn't look good. And yet, as you survey and as you begin to look at all the stumps, he says in verse 1, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. In the midst of despair and hopelessness, you see life. You see something green on the other side of this forest. There's a stump, and I see a shoot coming forth. It's not much. What good could come from this shoot? From this shoot, he says, he shall bear fruit. Turn over with me in Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. One of the most powerful chapters in all of the Bible, written hundreds of years before Jesus ever came on the scene. It says in Isaiah 53, 1, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. And he had no former majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. In other words, as we look at this person, there is nothing magical about him. There's nothing impressive about him. You don't look at this person and say, oh yeah, that guy's the king. He's the Messiah. He's the one that's going to get us out of this mess. It wasn't like, if you're familiar with history, it's not like a Judas Maccabee. It's like this guy who comes in and he's this military warrior and he just brings uh, this power with him and everybody says, this is the guy. He's going to make everything right. It wasn't like that with Jesus. People look at him and say, hey, this guy's from Nazareth. What good comes from Nazareth? Folks, I grew up in Henderson, Texas. And when you begin to talk to me about Kilgore, I begin to say, what good can come from that place? Because they were our rival, okay? We don't talk kindly about Kilgore until, you know, you get regenerated, and then you got to love them. You love your enemies. Maybe it's, anyway, we'll get, we'll get beyond that. But the point is, people looked at Jesus. What good can come from Nazareth? Oh, and by the way, he's not from royal blood, people with would think in that I mean he, he's Mary and Joseph really he's a carpenter he's not wealthy there's nothing prestigious about him there's nothing impressive about him and he's born in Bethlehem have you been to Bethlehem in the midst of our brokenness God brings forth restoration from the most unlikely places Israel was weak. God said, I'm going to restore you. Jesus was born, uh, born in Bethlehem, grew up in Nazareth, the son of a carpenter, and he's the son of God. This is where God loves to work. You say, we're out here, Taylor's Valley. You know, this isn't New York City. This isn't Shanghai. This isn't London. I mean, what, what good could we do here? God loves to take underdog stories. He loves to take people in the lowest of places and do something great through them. And whatever you're going through in your personal life this week, whatever brokenness that you're feeling, I want you to know this morning that your brokenness is not beyond God's restoration. God can bring healing into your life as individuals, as families, and churches, and nations. So there's a stump, and from that stump comes forth this shoot, and that ought to give us peace. I mean, as we're looking around, as we see the devastation sin causes, and as we think there may not be any hope, seeing that sign of life, that greenery, 
in the middle of it all gives us some peace. Okay, God's going to make this right. That's gonna, that twig is going to grow. That mustard seed is going to grow into something great. This is what the kingdom of God is like. It's like a mustard seed. It starts small. It seems insignificant. It seems like nothing good's going to come of it. And then the next thing you know, it is this powerful, world-altering kingdom. He did that with the disciples. He did that with his people throughout the years. So in the midst of brokenness, God's God brings restoration. Here's truth number two. The Messiah is able to bring restoration. The Messiah is able to bring restoration. You say, okay. So let, let's just be optimistic and say, sure, we live in a fallen world, and yet there's some hope. Now the question is, how, how's God going to deliver on that? And God's answer throughout the course of Scripture, he's going to deliver on that through the Messiah. It's just like some of us, again, uh, as we think about elections and politicians, we, a lot of times we place some of our, our trust and hopes in certain individuals, thinking, okay, they're going to bring about a transformation. They're going to bring about a change that we're hoping for. Okay, and of course, on any human level, they, they may do some of that. They may make some steps, and their progress may be made, and that's the best we can really hope for from a human being. They're going to do some good things, perhaps. This person will, perhaps this person won't, whatever. But we place some of our hopes in people, uh, thinking that, okay, once they institute their way, they're going to bring transformation, and it's going to be good. And so we have some hope in this uh, particular person. But none of them can fully deliver. And you say, well, can this person that we're talking about fully deliver? Look, look at the description. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equ equity the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and the breath of his lips. He shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. It's giving a profile, okay? Okay, he's going to do it. The, the shoot, he's talking about the branch, the Messiah. Okay, he's going to be the one to bring restoration. Well, how's he going to be the one to bring restoration? What, what's so special about him? Well, let me give you his profile is what Isaiah chapter 11 is saying. And so he begins to share all of these qualities of him that as we look at that, we think, oh, man, I wish we had one of those leaders here. He's the one that exemplifies everything that a perfect leader ought to look like. He's the one that exemplifies what a perfect human being looks like. Turn over with me to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. If there was any question that Jesus thought this way about himself, you know, some people think that Jesus came on the scene and, and he did some cool things, he said some cool things, but then uh, after that, uh, people made him to be something that he never really claimed to be. Well, Luke 4, starting at verse 16, presents a bit of a problem with that notion because it says that he came to Nazareth. So he went back to his hometown of Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. All I'm saying, synagogues, that's where uh, believers gathered together uh, in the Old Testament time, and even obviously up to the New Testament time, they gathered together to worship Yahweh. And all I'm saying is if Jesus thought it important enough to gather with other believers, maybe it's important enough for us as well. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. I guess they may not have had iPads in those days. I just don't know. Verse 18. And the, he quotes from Isaiah chapter 60, uh, 61, by the way. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me 
because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and he sat down and all the eyes were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. He's saying, the one you've been looking for, I am here. Repent and believe, for the kingdom is in your midst. Jesus says, the time is now. No more waiting, I'm here. And just a little bit later, uh, remember last week I told you uh, he gave his profile to John the Baptist. He basically said the exact same thing. What he read there, he basically said to John the Baptist, look around, that's what I'm doing. I'm doing what you've been looking for. Now that's true for the world. And that's one big point I want to make this morning is Jesus is the one who's going to bring restoration to the world. He's the one that's going to make all things new. But that's also true on a much smaller level of your personal life. Your sin is not beyond the restoration of God. You say, well, how is God going to fix this mess that is my life? Jesus is the answer. He's the answer. And sometimes our our faith may be shaken, and, and sometimes we may struggle trusting that. But remember... Again, that little passage I gave you at the beginning about uh, Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, he gives them this information to give them hope in a time of grief. It did not give hope to those who didn't believe it. It did not transform the thinking of those who did not receive that promise. Same with Isaiah chapter 9 that we went over last week. Didn't, Didn't give any hope to those who didn't believe those promises. And the same with Isaiah chapter 11. Jesus offers hope. He offers peace to those who believe Him, who trust Him, who rest and abide in Him. Brings us to truth number three this morning. The restoration will be radical and total. The restoration will be radical and total. Now, a few years ago, uh, I went hunting. And as I've told you before, I must be such an excellent marksman deer scared to walk out in front of me. Um, and so I've only had like one shot in about a decade. But anyway, I won't get into that because uh, we're not bitter this morning. But um, but uh, that particular year, I, I got my buck and everything. And so I went out and I was sitting there. And, and I just finished reading this article about the presence of coyotes and predators on the deer population. And because of their presence, uh, if predators are in an area, the deer population is like 30 to 50 percent. It's been like a decade. I can't really remember. But uh, it's like 30 to 50 percent less than if no predators were in that particular area. Okay. So I thought, well, that's fascinating. So if I, if I knock off a few predators, I raise a percentage of deer in any particular area by a significant margin. And so that year, just like a few weeks after I read that article, out trots this big coyote. And I'm, well, I've already shot my buck, so that's kind of what I was hoping for and looking for, a hog or just something, you know. And so here's this guy, and so boom, drop him right there in the spot. He hadn't hit the ground. Good. Here comes another one. And so, you know, I'm sitting there shuffling. I'm trying to text my father-in-law because he's on the other end of the, the woods. I'm trying to text him and say, I actually shot something this year. You won't believe it. And, but as I'm doing that, out trots another one. And so I'm fumbling around, you know, trying to get the bullet in the chamber and all this sort of stuff. And, and I, I shoot, and I, or I make a noise, and he stops, and I shoot him too. Well, what were they doing? Why were two coyotes trotting across there? Because just a few, like a minute before that, a doe and a yearling trotted right that same path, and they were hot on their tail. Now, I didn't say that so you'd feel bad about the deer, but um, it was a different time and a place. Anyway, um, 
The point is, they're predators. This is the world we live in. This is the animal kingdom. It is a violent, it is a, a ruthless place to be. And this picture that we have here in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6, speaks of a total transformation of everything. Now, some people may read this, and, and, and th there's different interpretations of what this all means. The, the bottom line principle, the plumb line principle is peace. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb. They don't hang out together, folks. Wolves and lambs do not hang out together. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat, a calf and the lion and the fattened calf together. The little child shall lead them, the cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. This is a radical transformation. This is a radical restoration and a full restoration. It's a picture of what we find in Revelation chapter 21 where it says that God wipes away every tear from our eyes and suffering shall be no more pain or death. They shall all be ended. I like what John Owen said about the death of Jesus. He said it was the death of death and the death of Christ. That was the death nail in death itself when Jesus died on the cross. Now, obviously, we still live in a world where that's present. There's suffering. There's pain. There's, there's turmoil. And, and all of those things are still present in the world. And yet we see the twig. Yet we see the shoot from the stump of Jesse. Yet we see what Christ has already done in hearts of people around the world, that even in ravaged places in the world, people still have peace in their hearts. Why? Because they know and they've experienced the person of Jesus Christ. And notice what it is that brings all this about. In verse, at the end of verse 9, the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. You know, the reality is that uh, sometimes even our hope, even though we have that information, we have that knowledge and that truth, even now sometimes our hope wavers. Because we, sometimes we have a hard time believing it. Sometimes we don't, we don't see it in the world. Our, our faith is shaken. But it, there's coming a day when the whole world, all creation will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. That knowledge that we see in part now, one day we shall see fully. One day shall be fully known. Now we see in the mirror dimly, but one day face to face. It's the difference between seeing an old rusty uh, uh, old, torn, or worn picture and having the reality right in front of us. Sure, we receive some, uh, some cheer and some, uh, some peace and hope by looking at a picture of people that we love, but there's no comparison to being in their presence, to seeing them face to face. And one day, all the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea, and that will change everything. It says in verse 10, In that day the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. Now I'm fully uh, in belief that that started to take place at the coming of Jesus, and he will bring that to uh, completion when he returns. Right now, the reason that we give to the International Mission Board is because right now we can go to any part of the world and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and know that the devil is defeated, he is a defeated foe, and he, he cannot overcome the gospel of Jesus Christ. He cannot deceive people from believing. His job is to blind the minds of believers to the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, but we know the gospel is advancing. That brings me to my last truth this morning that ought to give us peace. The restoration will be like a new exodus. The restoration will be like a new exodus. Now, I didn't read this earlier, but I want to read uh, the rest of this. And I didn't read it earlier because, uh, man, it's just got some big old names in there. And we didn't want to get, uh, uh, you know, I didn't want you all to think I was speaking in tongues or something. So look, that, look down at verse 12. It says, He will raise a signal for the nations and will assemble the banished of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So, in, in other words, there is this day coming where dispersed Israel, he will bring them back together. I will assemble the banished of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The jealousy of Ephraim shall depart, 
and those who harass Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not be jealous of Judah, and Judah shall not harass Ephraim. Speaking of Judah and Israel, two uh, major sections there. Verse 14, but they shall swoop down on the shoulder of the Philistines in the west, and together they shall plunder the people of the east, and they shall put out their hand against Edom and Moab, and the Ammonites shall obey them. And the, listen to this, and the Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the sea of Egypt. Now, what do we think about when we think of Egypt? Just think about that for a moment. And will wave his hand over the river with his scorching breath and strike it into seven channels and will lead people across in sandals. Where does this sound familiar? Verse 16, and there will be a highway from Assyria for the remnant that remains of his people as there was for Israel when they came up from the land of Egypt. Okay, so when he's talking about this peace that he's going to bring everybody, and he's and speaking through Isaiah the prophet, and he's trying to help Israel understand what will this be like, this peace that I'm going to give to you. What's, it, what's the experience going to be like? He uses the exodus to say that's what it's going to be like. Remember the exodus. They are in oppression. They are under Pharaoh. They got no cards to play. I mean, they're not going to rise up and face Egypt. They were the most powerful nation in the world at that point. Little old Israel not going to rise up and mount up a, a force against anybody. But God sends Moses in. He does all these plagues. And Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world at that point, he looks at one. He just His heart keeps hardening and hardening and hardening until finally you've got the Passover. And then there's the Passover. And there's the blood of the lamb over the, the doors of those who would be delivered and passed over. And so the spirit of death comes through, the angel of death comes through, takes the firstborn of all those who didn't have the blood of the lamb on the door of their house. And next thing you know, as a consequence of that, God's people are set free and delivered from Egypt. That is like what Jesus accomplished on the cross. It's the death, death itself, and the death of Christ. It is the blood of the Lamb on the doors of our hearts where we are saved, we are delivered. We start looking around, we say, hey, we're not in the promised land yet, no. But you're headed there. You're on your way because you just got set free from Egypt, and now you're wondering, uh-oh, got another problem. They're coming after us. That ain't good. Uh, it's great for us to be out and all, Moses, but... Now they're about to kill us in the desert. This just turned from bad to worse. But what did Isaiah 11 say? Again, he parts the waters, and they cross over in their sandals to the other side. And that's what this experience is like, to know Jesus Christ. It is like being delivered from oppression, and then at a moment where you think you're about to be destroyed— something miraculous happens and you just walk across to the other side to safety to where there's freedom to where there's grace and mercy and there's peace in your heart why because you're safe and we look in a world where there's so much brokenness and hatred and anger and and it's easy to get scared in the world but god's promise is a new exodus in jesus christ for those who believe in jesus christ those who didn't believe they're judged or they're left back in Egypt. Okay, not a whole lot of peace back there. There's not much peace in Egypt. There is immeasurable peace in the Messiah, in that new exodus. Now, my question for you this morning. You've heard all of this. God is not asking you this morning for some intellectual assent to the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's not asking you just to say, yeah, that's a nice story. I agree with it historically. What Jesus called people to do in response to his kingdom was to repent of their sins. In other words, you leave Egypt behind. Leave it behind. Put the blood of the lamb over the door of your heart and leave it behind. And do what? Follow after that cloud by day and pillar of fire by night. Follow after Yahweh who's revealed and manifested to us in the person of Jesus Christ. Follow him to refuge, to peace. He's our hope. Now this morning, if you've never trusted in Jesus, I invite you to come down and do it.
What I'm not saying to you this morning is you do that, hey, everything's just going to turn up sunshine and roses for you. You're going to look around even after you get on the other side of that river, and you're going to say, okay, now what? Still in the desert. Still, uh, Moses, we're hungry. Uh, okay, well, there's manna falling from heaven. Well, you know, I, I don't, I've got a, a problem eating that. I, I'm getting tired of eating it. Mo- I mean, there's still going to be problems on the other side of that river. But the thing that brings everything together is where you're headed. The fact that you're following Yahweh, the fact that you see the pillar, uh, uh, the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night changes everything to experience Jesus. So if you've never trusted in Jesus, you've never followed Jesus, I invite you this morning to repent of your sins and trust in him. He died on the cross for your sins. He took your punishment upon himself. And you say, well, how do I know that? How do I know that that was a demonstration of God's love and not just some crazy lunatic saying that he's the one and dying on a cross just like everybody else because God raised him from the dead, and he lives. He ascended to the right hand of God the Father, and one day he will return. And when he returns, there's going to be the sheep and the goats. There's going to be those who are in his family, those who are not in his family, but there will not be a gray area. So repent and believe in Jesus this morning. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. God, I pray if anyone is here who does not know Jesus and has experienced his peace, that they would. I pray for those of us who are on the other side of the river, that, Lord, you would give a safe harbor, that you would remind us where we've come from, you remind us where we're headed, remind us of those truths that, hey, we came up out of Egypt, we came up out of sin and death and darkness, that we would rejoice because of that, but that we would also have our minds renewed by knowing where we're headed, your kingdom, the reality of your kingdom. And so, Lord, we pray for your kingdom to come, your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, in our daily lives as it is in heaven. May we submit ourselves to the glad, joyful rule of Jesus. I pray your blessing over this time of response in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would, let's stand. The altar's open for whoever would feel led to respond this morning. My only hope.